So Massachusetts is a state in New England in the United States, and it's known for being cold. Boston is the biggest city there, though I grew up about an hour and a half west of that city. Looking back, I think I had a pretty great childhood, all things considered. I played a lot of sports. I played a lot of music. I had great and supportive friends. And so it was a pretty quiet suburban town, but I had a lot of access to big cities. So I would go see Broadway shows with my family in New York City, which is like two and a half hours away. Can't say anything bad about it. I know I probably complained when I was a kid about it being boring, but I truly had a super supportive family, great schools, and just had a lovely time back in Massachusetts and I visit regularly. I got the impression that you really love music because I found this YouTube video of you being the lead <laughs> singer of a choir. Yeah, I don't know if I was a lead singer of a choir, but basically over the course of my school years, I played a lot of classical music. I played piano and I played cello in our school orchestra. But when I got to college, I wasn't good enough to pursue music more. So I just tried to find an outlet where I could still do music things on the side while studying. So I joined an acapella group there. And that was like a great community. And I was able to continue doing music things. I'm not a great singer, but it was just one way of still finding a musical outlet at college because it was a big part of my life earlier. So that was a wonderful time. And I met a lot of great friends who I still talk to every day. But that was a great time in college just to continue doing music things. And you end up going to the University of Maryland College Park. You ended up doing quite a lot of things. You were writing for the school publication. You were also camp counselor for four years. And you even led a group to Israel for six weeks. What was that yeah. like? Yeah, I went to camp in New Hampshire for many years. And during the summers, I decided, why not? All my friends were doing it. I'll be a counselor too. So I was a counselor there for five years. And I happened to have the same kids for each summer, which was super rewarding. A lot of other counselors were like moving around and being counselors for a variety of age groups, but I had the same kids and we all grew older together and I led them on a trip to Israel one summer. Those kids have become honestly really good friends. I mean, they're like 26 now, so they're not really kids. <laughs> and uh, actually uh, a few of them are staying with me this weekend in New York City. So we're having a good time, but it's just another fun thing that I did. And a lot of people say you need to have an internship over your summers in college. And there was a lot of pressure to get a job that furthers your career. And I was never going to be a professional camp counselor, but somehow I found it to be a, a really rewarding experience. And now I have a lot of great friends who I'm still in touch with. And I do think it was a great entry into the workforce for a college kid. Since people were pressuring, you know, as is normal in college on thinking about your future, did you have an idea of what you want in the future? No clue. I had absolutely no clue. Some of my friends were in pre-med, so they knew they were going to be doctors and others were also fairly certain of their future. But most of us, I would say at college, did not really know. I mean, we were like 18 to 20 years old. I don't know how many people know what they want to do or even know the full suite of opportunities that are available for someone. I had no idea. I took history because I was just thinking, oh, I could read and write and that's what I like to do. And those skills would be helpful for any sort of profession going forward. So I just tried to take a bunch of different classes and learn a bunch of different things and try to figure out what I wanted to do. And I don't think I figured it out by the end. You said you read and write. I heard in a different interview, you said that you weren't serious about it and you didn't think it was a potential career. It was that you loved writing. Yeah, I definitely did not. It just seemed like a super impossible thing to make a living off of. And I just didn't think I was that good enough. So I was like, all right, I'll just try something else. And maybe I'll have this always as a hobby. But I never thought that I would do it as a profession. So that something else was teaching geography and urban studies, which sounds wildly different from history. How did that happen? Well, I'd always been very passionate about cities and urban planning and geography. Like even when I was three years old, I was looking at maps and atlases and just the way I think about the world is very spatial. And the first thing I always ask people is where they're from. It's just the most interesting thing to me about a person or a community love traveling. So that was always in the back of my mind as something I wanted to pursue. I didn't really do it in college, but in, in grad school, I did go to Philadelphia and Temple for urban planning and spent two years there doing various internships and jobs related to economic development, bringing in jobs. 
to various regions and how different places can grow. So that was fun. <laughs> so how does one go from urban studies to applying to Morning Brew? I had heard of Morning Brew through a mutual friend. I didn't know anything about business or business news. I studied history and I had a couple friends in the business school and I was like, these guys are annoying because they don't have class on Fridays. They didn't seem to do much work. So I looked at the whole business world a little scornfully and I didn't know that much, but I always loved reading the news and making it funny for people. So I just was like scrolling on LinkedIn one day and I saw that the CEO of Morning Brew was looking for another writer. I happened to know a few people who were in Morning Brew's orbit at the time. So I called them up and I was like, should I apply? And they were like, definitely. And I just read the newsletter as it existed. And I thought I could do it better than it currently read. So I applied. <laughs> you end up getting rejected the first time, but you sent a really nice letter. What was that letter about? And do you think that played a part in you eventually getting hired? I think so. Yeah. So I applied and went through the entire process, wrote a bunch of samples, went into interview with them, and they ended up going with someone else who was another writer. But that didn't, when they started talking about contract and actually putting them on board, it didn't work out. But before that, Alex, the CEO, sent an email to me being like, sorry, man, it was a really nice email. He was like, we should definitely keep in touch in the future. And so I just struck the same tone and thinking, well, this sucks that it didn't work out, but might as well not burn any bridges. I had a great experience. It seems like they're a growing company, so they'll probably hire more people in the future. And it seemed like I was second place at least, and they definitely liked my stuff. You know, just the way I treat everything is be respectful and you never know what's gonna happen in the future. So I sent that note and uh, a few months later, Alex said things didn't work out and they liked to hire me. This so. was back in August, 2017 when you joined, which is the tech boom. What was the newsletter industry like? I mean, now Substack writers have exploded. Right. I don't think it's quite that huge a thing at the time. It definitely wasn't. It's hard to think back about what it was like. The Skim was definitely the major player and they definitely pioneered the business model. Prior to the Skim, there were definitely a bunch of newsletters, but they were more in like niche communities. And I would say the Skim was the most popular and popularized the entire industry. So we were able to ride their wave. There definitely was no sub stack um, newsletter, you know, maybe you were getting a few newsletters, but not every publisher seems to all they want to do is send out newsletters like from the New York Times, so Wall Street Journal to every single legacy, legacy media outlet. So it definitely was more of like a niche thing. We also had trouble convincing advertisers that newsletters were a good way to advertise because it was seen as just like a new and an emerging space that they didn't necessarily have a lot of experience with. So I think in the early days, it was like, yeah, you should spend some money on newsletters. And they were like, what's that? Are you sure? And then now, obviously, it's a much easier sell. Just four years ago, it was a very fledgling industry and not many people were looking into it. So I think we were definitely in the right place at the right time. And to also put it in context, at the time, you, Alex Austin, the co-founders, were also really, really young. You just graduated from college. So going out and asking people to invest and believe in you is quite a stretch. Did it ever cross your mind or did you ever find yourself wondering, what am I doing? This might go now when I've just wasted my first few years out of college. Maybe. So I was a little bit older because I just graduated grad school. So I was like 25 or something and they were really young. They were like 23 and 24. So I was just blown away by their maturity and their ability to just hustle and grind and just do whatever is necessary to make something happen. And I would say I was never sort of like in doubt of this thing not working like ever. And I think I was dumb, but I also didn't know much about the startup world and the facts that like 90% of startups don't make it. The luck is against you. Like it's supposed to make it as a four person startup, but I just had no idea. And <laughs> I was like, well, we're growing. I'm working with really smart people. I'm still young. So if this fails, I'll probably have something else to do. I have a grad degree, so I had like a, a cushion, so to speak, but I still just never even thought of the alternative that this thing wouldn't work out. I was just writing the newsletter every day and I thought I was putting out a good product and making it better every single time. And we were getting good feedback and Alex and Austin and a couple of the other younger or earliest employees were 
just hustling and making stuff happen. And there was just like no feeling around the office in those days that anything could go wrong. When they around three to four of you, you had to move to New York and was in an incubator for a bit. What was that like? I read that you were writing for nine hours every single day and then having to input it into the HTML code. It was a grind. Uh, it was definitely a grind. I don't know if I would call it an incubator. I think that's what they build it at, as, but it was just this like room in NYU near Washington Square Park where a bunch of people who were working on startups had computers. So it was definitely like not a very nice place and it wasn't like a WeWork as you would imagine it or a new co-working space in 2021. But yeah, I didn't know much about business. So I had to really read the news really intently to understand what was going on and why these people were important. So writing every story took me a really long time. And then on the other end, our tech system was just not that developed for email. And so it took a while to code everything and make sure everything looked good. Email is a little bit annoying because you have to send across Gmail and Outlook and a bunch of different email providers. So we sent so many test emails out. Like one time we sent a huge poop emoji out to the entire list. You would write the newsletter and that'd be fine. And then the last like three or four hours of the day was just like in the code, trying to make it so it didn't look terrible and looked fine for all email users. And then Alex also was the editor for Morning Brew in the early days. And he definitely was very, very much of a stickler. <laughs> and we'd spend hours going back and through edits. It was definitely like a perfectionist mindset, like every word needs to be perfect. I mean, with any business, you always think of, oh, who's your avatar? And I wonder if you personally had that idea of who an avatar was and if it's evolved over time. Oh, yeah, it's definitely evolved. I would say our initial customer was like a finance or a business student in college who was preparing to hit the workforce and needed help interviewing. And that's how Morning Brew Group like started organically a bunch of his classmates asked Alex at University of Michigan help for interviewing. I've never done this, but in banking and finance interviews, you, they ask you about like what's going on in the world. And a lot of young kids don't want to read the Wall Street Journal or any other newspaper. So they don't really know what's going on and they don't really want to find out. So he started sending out Morning Brew as like a PDF email to his friends just to keep them up to date with what's going on so they could score their interviews. So in the early days, it was definitely more of like a banking, finance, Wall Street newsletter. Over the course of the last five years, it's definitely evolved as the audience has grown. I would say only like five to 10% of our audience currently works in finance and banking. So it's much more of a mass audience who doesn't necessarily work in business. And we've definitely changed our content to match that. We definitely still focus on the business world, but now it's really like the intersection of business and politics, business and social and society, business and culture, business and the environment. Just because we don't think our readers are super, super care about like the Wall Street drama anymore. They're very interested in stocks and investing in crypto, but it's just a completely different customer than the initial days where it was like college students. How do you know who is actually reading? Do you actually go out to them and ask for many, many surveys to figure out how their interests have evolved? Yeah, that's honestly the only way to do it because we're not like Facebook or Google and know everything about you. We really don't know much about you at all. Our data on the back end is really whether you open the newsletter or not and what you clicked on. So that's really all we have to go off of. So we definitely need to send surveys to find out who our reader is, especially for the sales team to go out and sell the audience to advertisers. They need to know where they live and what they're making and all of that stuff. So we are gearing up more of our survey data and processes right now. It, I wouldn't say we send out a lot of surveys right now, maybe like once a quarter, once every half a year to find out who people are. But the other way we find out who they are is an email inbox that people reply to at the end of every day. And that doesn't give us like aggregate data, but you can kind of sense of who's replying and what kind of people they are and what questions they have. So we have some sense of people who are super engaged with our product. So you get people who actually do use that reply button and give lots of opinions. Oh yeah, all the time, ever since the early days. And I used to spend hours in there every morning talking to people. We felt that that was really important to like build the connection between our readers and the writers and to show that we really care what you think. And we're not just sending this email to the void and just writing the next one. Like we want to establish a connection with you. So that was really important for us. And I spent every day 
like hours a day just replying back to people whether they were super pissed or really liked it and there's everything in there actually we still do that i don't have time to do that much anymore but people still reply and we've hired uh, several interns to help reply to people you said that people get super pissed why would they get super pissed at you for just reporting the news oh i mean People get so angry with the news all the time. They hate the news. I don't know. It's literally anything, whether it's a typo or you phrase something wrong, you left out one of their pet projects or something they care about a lot, especially when you talk about sensitive subjects, people, guns, abortion, politics, Trump, like that's also sets people off. So it really is everything. Like whatever you think people can get angry about, they get angry about. There was this newsletter you started because of the election that was entering into politics. Was there a lot of discussion behind the scenes of should we even enter into this space because it's so controversial? Yeah, there was a lot of discussion. I mean, I think in the early days, Morning Brew definitely stayed away from politics. It was very much like we're business and finance and people like us for staying out of politics and, you know, let's just not even go there. They like that we're unbiased and all that. And I, I don't know, I would say when I came in and over the course of Morning Brew's career, we've definitely dipped way more toes in politics because I just think you can do it and, and stay objective and not really compromise your values of being nonpartisan or anything like that. And you just can't divorce the business world from politics at all. And I think Trump really brought those two together. And now it's just like the cat's out of the bag. CEOs are going to the White House every day. Obviously, economic policy really determines everything about business world. And then also the pandemic, like fused the two together. So now Pfizer is a company, is a private sector company. They're also intertwined with everything going on in the world right now. And I think you could point to a million other companies that you can't divorce like their business interests from what's happening in the wider world. So we've sort of leaned into politics and we're not going to like report on the horse race of every election cycle or things like that. We'll still make business our main focus, but I think we're comfortable leaning into politics a little bit more than we used to be. I heard in an interview that Alex said from the period of 2016, 2019, there were three tactics used to turn Morning Brew into business, which was write, grow and sell. And I wonder if you could elaborate a bit more about each of these pillars, starting with like, what was it like to basically figure out where to find your source and how to distill it into something that was really unique or what's called a great product. Yeah, my job in the early days was just to make the best newsletter possible. So I had time. I wasn't doing a whole lot else. I was just going into work every day. And obviously there was a lot going on, but my job was make the best newsletter possible. So I was definitely not great at it in the early days, but I just read so much so much news and i still do and i think that's the only key to understanding how to write this newsletter and i think i just had a good sense of curation and understanding what people were most interested in and obviously in the early days like i might have written some articles that people on the outside were like no one cares about this like <laughs> if you knew anything about the business world you would not write this like it's just not material to our lives and i still probably get things wrong so i, I just think immersing yourself in the world was super helpful and then the process of writing, like, I still don't think I'm an amazing writer, but it just, so it takes me a lot of time. I had a co-writer and we would just agonize over every word. We would spend a half hour thinking of the right joke for a particular sentence and figuring out the best order. And so we would just spend, honestly, it was just like spending so much time. It was never easy. We would agonize over every little thing. And we still do in the newsletter. And also like crafting the tone was really important for us, I think. We didn't really make up this tone or style. We just wrote the way we wanted to write and talk. And I think it just slowly evolved into a, a tone and style that people seem to resonate with. That's the writing part. It really hasn't changed. I've been writing and helping write the newsletter for almost five years now. And every day it happens. So that's a great lesson. Like if you want to get something done, just put a deadline on it because you don't have a choice. Like I don't have a choice. This, the newsletter is coming out tomorrow. So you better write it. Have you ever missed a day? In 2017, I already had a trip planned, so I missed a week. But I don't think I've missed another day. I think I've... A week in I've, five years is nothing. <laughs> well, we have some vacation. We have vacation over Christmas break and some Thanksgiving stuff. But I think at least I've hit publish or at least been there at the end for every single other day that we send a newsletter. A question that a lot of people would have listening to you is how on earth do you keep at it? 
five years is a really long time and counting. Do you ever feel like you were fatigued, that you want to break beyond that one week? Yeah, I would say something that I realized helps is like, I don't have kids. I'm like a single guy in New York City, so I can sort of devote time to work. I obviously have family at home and love hanging out with friends and like have a social life that I hope is good. But um, <laughs> yeah, at the end of the night, like I don't have to, you know, take my kid to the doctor's office for some medical emergency or anything like I think that's a huge overlooked part for startups, at least from my perspective, it does require like more time effort. Like, I don't think Morning Brew would have been as successful if we all just didn't sort of work extra hours over the course of the day and make it happen. I'm not an advocate of like overworking yourself at all. I'm just saying like, from my experience, we had to work more than the average person works to get this thing off the ground. And I think I still do. So for some reason, I haven't like burnt out yet. I think... The fact that I really like what I do and the news is changing every day. You know, you wake up the next day and you have no idea what you're going to write. You don't know what's going to happen in the world. So that makes it like a fresh and unique challenge every day. So yeah, I definitely get a lot of energy about just, I really enjoy it. Every day is a new, every day is a new challenge. So I don't feel fatigued. Are there any particular stories over the course of you being at Morning Blue that stand out that might have say, contribute to being a milestone in Morning Brew's growth? I think there's some few wins from the growth stage that were really interesting from the growth perspective, because the newsletter hasn't changed a whole lot. But in terms of the right growth style, there have been milestones in those other two. And there were a few Instagram ads that did really well for Morning Brew in the early days. We weren't paying for advertising. And we started putting on a little money into Facebook and Instagram and Snapchat. And one particular ad creative did really well. And so we like dumped our entire bank account into that one particular ad creative. And everyone was super hyped the next day because we got a lot of subscribers. And when you get more subscribers, more people share, and it's just this great domino effect. So if you can get a lot in one fell swoop, it's really helpful. So I remember us all being super pumped about that. And then another one was in Gmail, there's different tabs in Gmail and it really matters for open rates. So if you're in the promotions tab, it's not super great because you're buried in there with like e-commerce brands and coupons and stuff like most people don't really read. And you want to be in the primary tab where all your friends are and your work emails are. So one day we have been in the promotions tab for a long time and we've been lobbying Gmail and like just trying our hardest to get from promotions to primary, we were doing everything we could. And one day it switched over to primary and like our open rate jumped by 10%, the way more people were opening it. So I remember that was like another big milestone in the early days where it was like, wow, this is really great. We've been working so hard to do this and we have no idea why it just happened, but it did. And so we're just gonna really keep going and ride it. Was this before the 2018, 2019 period? It was maybe in 2018. Because that was the giant growth period, right? You went from 100,000 subscribers to a million subscribers. Would you say that the Gmail tab category was a major contributing factor? Was there something else? I think it was a lot of different factors. That was a big one. We started spending a lot more on advertising and getting subscribers. That helped. Then we had this referral program, which my friend Tyler built, which is like what people know Morning Brew for. And a lot of people have tried to emulate it, which is basically when you hit certain subscriber targets, you get swag or exclusive content. So that was super helpful for us. So I think it was just the confluence of a lot of different things that led to that period of growth. I saw quite a few articles that Tyler Deng, who was then the senior yeah. product lead, he wrote about basically building Morning Brew and the tech behind it. And I found it interesting. He said that he created the customized referral system that mm-hmm. Morning Brew uses. How important is having your own system as opposed to something that the party had? I don't know the answer to that question. I think ours being one that we created, we obviously had a lot more control over it. We didn't have to call up anybody when we wanted to change something. If something broke, Tyler could go in and fix it himself. But it seems like most of the options are third-party sources. We used to get emails every day being like, what's the referral program you use? Because I want to use it. So we had to create a template. Like we made it. Sorry, bud. It seemed like a pretty unique thing in the industry to create your own, but I'm just not well-informed enough to say how that differs from what is 
also on the marketplace, but I know it was obviously a lot of work early on, but it was super helpful for us. And obviously like other people were pretty envious of it. So I have to say it was probably a, a good decision. I don't know if it's the right decision for every publisher to build their own referral system when there's probably great ones on the market. You saying that a lot of people ask you about how they can use the system you use makes me think of so many startup stories where they pivot because they realize that, oh, I have something else that mm-hmm. other people like. So sort of like Justin Khan with Twitch, that's how it happened. Was there never a discussion of selling your referral systems or were you just solely focused on new stuff? This is our business. All we're going to do right now. We've had a million ideas. Like I don't remember them all. <laughs> We were like, let's go into the events. We were just like throwing a bunch of ideas at the wall. We should create like internal newsletters for different companies like Axios is doing right now. Like let's use the morning brew template and pair with whatever company to send out their own internal communications. We threw like a bunch of ideas at the wall. And at the end, I think what really worked for us was just staying focused and growing the main newsletter to millions of people and then using that as distribution channel for other sorts of products. Like we have done, we have like executed on some of our ideas at this point, like video and podcasts and other newsletters and virtual events and things like that. So I wouldn't say we don't just throw out an idea and not do it, but for some of like the more software based stuff, like we only had one to two engineers on the team for most of the time. So whatever we said was certainly not realistic. I think we maybe entertained it for a little bit and then we're like, we can barely just do this one thing. So maybe we should stick with that. Fair enough. In terms of the referral program, I've read that it takes up 20 to 25% of the signups that you get. Why do you think that it's done so well? You offer, say, stickers. If you do five referrals, 15 gets you a coffee mug. Don't people have more than enough stickers and mugs? I don't know. I don't want a sticker. I don't like that doesn't appeal to me, but I obviously don't understand human nature. People love stickers. One of the biggest drivers of that, I think, was this one thing we used to have, which was Light Roast, which is our Sunday newsletter. And that was extra content. We didn't have a Sunday newsletter. And when you hit three referrals, you got a Sunday newsletter from us. And that felt good to me because I was writing the content, obviously. So The fact that people would share to get more of it on a day that they didn't have it was pretty awesome to hear. And I think that was like a huge driver of subscriber growth and a big reason why people shared. And they also want swag and stuff. Like, I guess people want free t-shirts. I mean, I would go to like random club meetings in college just to get a free t-shirt. That's no different. So yeah, we moved our Sunday edition to have like, instead of having it behind like a subscriber paywall, we now opened it up to everyone. So we were still looking for that one great driver of referrals again in the uh, referral system because we kind of removed maybe one of the most highly anticipated uh, rewards. What's well, amazing is that you also have a reward for someone who's given a thousand referrals. They get an yeah. epic work from home makeover. And some people have reached that milestone. And I wonder if you've analyzed and found out what distinguishes these people give over a thousand referrals compared to one who might just read and make one referral. There aren't many. I would say it's in the single digits, but people have hit a thousand referrals. I've met a few of them. When the world wasn't all remote, we would invite them to New York City to hang out with us. So we have spent a few days with these people and I don't think they're any different. They're just normal people. Who, <laughs> everyone has their own like particular hobbies and things they get super into for a, a little period of time. And I don't think these people were like way more into morning brew specifically, but they devise these interesting ways of getting a lot of referrals. Like maybe they were at a college and there was just like a ton of people around to be able to get a thousand referrals. And then one guy also did like, he had a website, you know, and it was highly trafficked and he was able to generate a lot of signups that way by putting his link very visibly. Another guy bought search ads, like people just kind of like hack their way to a thousand referrals. Not everyone, but some people did. And so they're just like you and me and just found a way to get a thousand referrals. I don't know if they were like, woke up every morning thinking about it. I recently listened to an episode on Founders Journal by Alex, and he talked about momentum and how momentum equals action plus desire and reflection. And I wonder, you know, especially during that period, 2018, 19, when you grew to one and a half million subscribers, how did Morning Brew plan to capitalize on that momentum? Is there anything that upon reflection you thought you could do better? I don't know 
I think it was a period where we were exploring, okay, we now have a big audience. What's next? And that was like the main discussion because for many years, we focused on growing the main newsletter. It took me a while to really feel happy with the newsletter. Multiple years in, I was still not feeling, as I've talked about, like it was still very much a grind. I I had to work really hard every day to figure out what I should write. And only a few years ago did I really feel like I got in a groove with it. And it was a really, really good product. So we were still figuring out how to perfect the main newsletter. But when we felt good about that, I would say in like 2019, and we had a lot of subscribers, we were like, all right, we want to just be more than a newsletter company, or we want to just have more than one product. So that was a time of just exploring what that could be. And like I said, we threw a ton of ideas at the wall. And we landed on doing sub industry verticals, which was a tactic that Axios was doing. And it was what Industry Dive has most popularly done, which has a bunch of newsletters across every single type of profession. And the idea was to not go after a mass market anymore, but go after a smaller community. You can charge more to advertisers. You can go down funnel with that community and create communities like online communities you can do events and so we launched emerging tech brew that year and that's led to a pretty thriving what we call b2b business 